Uh, well, thank you very much to the uh, MAB for inviting me. And I was a little bit astonished that you'd want to hear from me because I've been going to various states and territories in Canberra uh, talking about public sector reform, mainly at the state and Commonwealth level, but it does have uh, implications for local government. And if there's any time and any questions, I'll seek to answer those. Uh, I do have a view on the referendum issue, but maybe we want to duck and weave around that one for a while. Uh, based on observations on uh, my unusual career for a public servant, which is uh, I've worked at the Commonwealth level three times, in Victoria twice, and the Queensland government once. And now I'm the only government job I've got is chairing a statutory authority for the new, or once well, recently new, New South Wales government, the Barangaroo Authority that uh, occasionally gets mentioned in the media and is sometimes fun. My general thesis, though, <coughs> is a pretty simple one. First, that public sector reform and major economic reform are two sides of the same coin. And second, and as a consequence of that, strategic public sector reform is going to be crucial to the future prosperity of Australia. And that will be true for the work of public administrators at the Commonwealth, the state, and also, I believe, and local government levels. Fundamentally, I think we have a good story to tell about public sector uh, reform and administration in Australia. It's a story that public administrators and elected officials at all levels of government should take, in my view, a great deal of pride in. But like all good prophets, I also want to issue a few warnings about the future. But, but let me start with a confession. At the risk of totally destroying my prospects on the lucrative TED speaker circuit, I'll admit that the idea of reforming to create value the context of public administration is not indeed a new one. In fact, some would say that it goes back millennia if you embrace China in the definition of public administration. Public sector reform can, see, can, reform can seem like the pursuit of the ever receding horizon. We can see where we are going, but we never actually get there. In fact, it's quite the opposite. A better analogy is an electric generator where movement and change actually creates something of value. It is worth reflecting just for a moment on just what has been created in Australia over the last 30 to 40 years. In that time, the Australian economy has been transformed from a moribund, insular backwater into a modern, globalised economy, dynamic enough to create enormous wealth and opportunity, and strong enough to survive multiple economic shocks. During that time, our national prosperity has grown equitably, and will remain more equitable country than most others. We have achieved some of the best results in the uh, world, in the developed world in particular, in population health and educational attainment at relatively modest cost. Although there is still a great deal more to do, particularly for people from disadvantaged backgrounds. Our increasingly diverse population inhabits peacefully a huge land area without vast disparities in services available and regional incomes. And we've done all those things while avoiding the worst excesses of the European welfare state. Well, that may be true, the professional cynics say, but the dead hand of public administration still holds Australia back. So here are four questions that I'd like to put to you, and uh, I'll give you the answers as well, but uh, they're worth pondering. First, as a share of GDP, has the cost of government gone up dramatically in Australia? Second, which country has a higher public share, uh, public sector share of GDP, Australia or the United States? Third, as a share of total employment, has the public sector share of total employment, including local government, gone up or down in the last 25 years? And fourth, if you are a 62-year-old grandmother and it costs $21,239 for a hip replacement in Australian public hospitals, does it cost 11000 or 125000 for the same operation in the United States? So here are the answers, which run counter to some of the media driven assumptions about the health of the Australian Westminster system of government. First, contrary to the myth that the public sector in Australia is growing out of control, in reality, measured as a proportion of GDP, the total cost of three levels of government has been relatively constant at around 35% of GDP, although government revenues, as the Treasury Secretary was commenting yesterday, 
uh, at the moment are below trend, which accounts for the head of government stimulus. Second, contrary to the myth that government in Australia is vastly bigger than other countries, the cost of government in Australia as a percentage of GDP is one of the lowest in the OECD, second or third lowest, far lower than our traditional comparators, the UK, New Zealand and Canada, and most uncomfortably for some critics, even lower than the United States. Third, contrary to the myth that public service employment is out of control, the reality is that as a percentage of total employment in the economy, even allowing for the complexities of privatisation, public sector employment has fallen steadily since the 1980s. In fact, combined local, state and Commonwealth government employment has gone down from 25% of the total workforce in the mid-1980s to about 16% now. And fourth, the answer to the last question about whether it costs half as much or five times more than a hip operation in the US, the answer is, well, both, actually. Having such wildly disparate prices between and within hospitals for exactly the same operation looks to me like a system in America that is wildly unfair because the information about this has been concealed from public view and the variation observed is not the normal consequences of an efficient market. And secondly, inefficient, with costs obscured and driven up or down in line with provider preference, not real competition on, uh, within an informed marketplace. In Australia, thanks to bodies like the little known but important independent hospital pricing authority, we now have an agreed price that government will start to pay next financial year for hospital procedures across the country. This means that after nearly 40 years, we get an efficient baseline for providers in the public hospital system and the potential for more competition in the system because greater transparency has always been a precondition if the private system is to compete with the public system on quality and price. Now, this is one anecdote and in a long and complex tale. Along the way, public administrators and public administration reform have been actively connected to that national success. The last 30 years is not a picture of public administration standing still and gradually sinking into a swamp. What has underpinned success over the decades is the link between public sector reform and economic reform. Well, now, I will not dwell now on, on the sketch on the sketch of the economic reform story in Australia over the last 30 or 40 years, but outline some themes in what I think will be the next wave of public sector reform in Australia. However, I note that a justification for these future reforms is their potential contribution to economic growth and prosperity. Arguably, the reforms of the public sector linked to economic and social reform began with the Coombs Royal Commission in 1976. In particular, the reform emphasis on rebalancing the relationship between ministers and public servants. The balance had become tilted a little too much towards the then permanent heads of departments, or as they were characterised in the British TV show long ago, the Sir Humphreys of the Australian system. I think it was a very good system, and people thought it needed to change. <laughs> In the 1990s, a further set of public sector reforms effectively supported and implemented national competition policy. They included privatisation, corporatisation, and outsourcing of many public sector business services. At the time, many of these services were frankly insufficiently disciplined in the use of capital, and you can see that still today in some other states, not so much Victoria. And their operation often, often involved waste and underperformance. There is still further work that could be done in that area, mainly elsewhere, not so much in Victoria. It was also the beginning of a new and more sophisticated approach to public sector management processes to moderate the provider-driven character of many big service delivery systems in the public sector. We saw public administra administrators develop some of the tools that have really made an enormous contribution, believe it or not, to our national wellbeing. The case mix system for funding in, the, in hospitals, which radically transformed our ability to ensure that public dollars are well spent. And the beginning of student-centred um, funding in schools and VET student-centred funding is, is another way of delicately 
we're talking about vouchers. These reforms are an essential precondition for the productivity reforms possible in the broad social policy area and capable of uh, these reforms are capable of delivering huge gains. Now some of those reforms place particular pressure on local government, but it's also to the credit of governments in Victoria, Queensland and Western Australia that they shared some of the incentive payments that came from the incentive payments uh, out of the Commonwealth as a reward for states that undertook reform. At the level of the Australian Public Service, the most recent reforms are those set out in the report I'm responsible for ahead of the game in 2010. These are making, about making sure that the public sector has up-to-date capabilities to contribute to broader economic and social reform and in particular offer a better integrated response to the needs of citizens. I'm personally drawn to the next wave of public sector reform and is, as it is a necessary part of how we create more wealth and more opportunity for more people in our country. Now to a brief sketch of the five themes of this public sector reform. It is axiomatic that the public service serves the elected government of the day. However, the best service the public service should, should uh, sustain is one that involves a long-term focus on strategic thinking in all areas of public sector activity. It should be thinking beyond ever accelerating news and electoral cycles. A reservoir of such strategic thinking is an important investment in effective policy making when circumstances, as they inevitably do, change and the unexpected demands a response. Past contributions from the public service have helped us immensely as a nation. There might also be a greater acceptance that public administrators should help explain long-term strategy in a similar manner to what is now broadly accepted for leaders of many agencies. Think of the government of the Reserve Bank, for example. That's not about usurping the role of ministers to make announcements, but allowing public servants to brief journalists or background them about the technical basis of major decisions by government would be one way of reducing the ridiculous pressure that ministers are placed under and the cynicism that the public and the media have towards what they see as spin-doctored announcements. It is an idea that worked well in the past and the proliferation of new online media sources and the decline of the traditional camera press gallery make this change, in my view, all the more urgent. That said, public administra administration would also benefit from some more strategic thinking about the way we work internally. Undoubtedly, there is a lot more we can do to give citizens a better deal through joining up service delivery, increasing efficiency and improving quality, working to reasonable and measurable outcomes, and consolidating the way we work. My second reform proposal is about the structure of government. Too often, this type of discussion gets lost amongst the abolish the states fantasists or to subdivide our system into 16 states theorists, or in some parts of Australia, the secede from the Commonwealth uh, mumbling that drifts out from time to time. By default, our public administration structures tend to mirror our political structures, but new alternatives are possible. And 111 years after Federation, public administrators probably understand better than anyone the need to find better ways of balancing state and commonwealth responsibilities and involving local government, improving state and local community coordination, and shifting away from highly centralised head offices and towards local delivery institutions. Unpicking or cutting the Gordian knot of commonwealth state financial relations will require considerable political will and probably quite some time. But while we wait for that shift, it is worth really remembering that we have already been able to create new types of accountability structures in areas like health that create local, greater local independence and that can tap into local community knowledge, skills and networks. It has been precisely those types of new accountability structures that have been at the, at the heart of reforms uh, like local healthcare networks and hospitals. But that will, that will uh, not be enough in that area, it's needed in the new NDIS as well. As I said at the beginning, 
partly due to its uh, geography and its history of decentralisation. Queensland has been thinking about devolution for a long time, but Victoria has actually done a lot of it, but the other states are still uh, under pressure to emulate and implement themselves. The great advantage of devolution to local governance arrangements is the improvement it can bring in critical service delivery areas, such as hospitals, schools, and vocational education and training. Done well, it's a way of improving the quality of services, the efficiency of services, and the responsiveness of services to local circumstances. But there are some crucial caveats. To be successful, devolution to local governance must be accompanied by substantial investment in systems, in management capabilities and systems at the local level, and in having a more sophisticated approach to planning, results, and accountability. Now, the same three points would apply where devolution explicitly to local government is what is at stake. My third area of reform involves public administration putting its own house in order. The shift to new local government's arrangements will have some big implications for the types of schools that public administrators need. And I will come back to those in just a moment. But there are other types of structural reforms to departments that could make a difference. A lot of functions could be decanted out of cumbersome departments and poured into agencies which have credible, professional and accountable governance structures. So in Victoria, <coughs> I'm one of those who believe that when we knocked off the Melbourne Metropolitan Board of Works, the government structures of which had a very strong place for people from local government, we did Melbourne a huge disservice from which planning, strategic planning in the city has never fully recovered. In general, it is easier for agencies to bring in people with expertise from outside government. For many reasons, smaller agencies are often more efficient than departmental conglomerates. They also provide the potential for more effective and innovative service delivery and more specialised policy advice or necessary regulation. Of course, there are some benefits in having few larger departments compared to lots of small departments. But the risk is that you end up with departments that are vast, complex public sector conglomerates. And my observation has been that those large bodies tend to lose strategic focus, lose their innovative edge, and end up being a lot less efficient than we want them to be and that the leaders want them to be. We could also usefully re-examine the role of our super supervisory bodies, like the Auditors General. We now have a wide range of investigative and inquisitorial, and inquisitorial bodies generally in our system of government in Australia, including in Victoria, which are there ultimately to lighten the load of Parliament itself. But it's probably time, I think, for a commission of inquiry to look at how these bodies could relate more effectively to Australian parliaments and at the national level to the Australian parliament in particular. They will continue, obviously, to have a very important function, uh, probably, particularly if we transfer, transfer more accountability into those agencies I mentioned before. But despite all the performance reviews done by the Australian Auditors General since the late 70s, we still don't have consistent and persuasive pressure from them to achieve the one thing they should teach us to adopt, which is reliable, sensible performance measurement for the programs and operations of departments and agencies. My fourth area of reform is therefore our accountability processes. And as I just said, supervisory bodies like auditors, generals, officers play a crucial role in accountability. But there are other practical steps we could also take. We need to make the heads of agencies and, and departments at the Commonwealth and state level were directly accountable in their own right to parliamentary committees for delivery, particularly through the examination of much improved annual reports that actually tell you something that's worthwhile. And because parliamentary committees are a limited resource, we could also think about the creation of departmental advisory boards that sit alongside secretaries while including them as members. One of the particular opportunities in that change would be to bring in non-executive board members from outside the public service, in some cases perhaps from local government, who would bring particular skills and insight into the running of a department. Not in policy advice, but in management, 
operations and efficiency or lack of it. It will also put more special scrutiny on the performance of a departmental head, uh, which will be a challenge for some, but in my view, a necessary one. These reforms should also lead to a rethink about the idea of ministerial responsibility. Now, I genuinely have been very impressed uh, in my 24 years as a public sector CEO with the talents of the political leadership that I've seen in that career. But it's unfair to expect those talents to also include having the skills to be the chair and sole board member of a very large enterprise, which is what most government departments actually are. At the moment, the media is prepared to hold ministers responsible for anything that crops up in their portfolio. And as anyone with any experience of working with ministers know, in practical terms, this cannot work. It creates confusion, public dissatisfaction, the removal of any real sanctions for poor performance, and exhaustion for ministers over time as they cope with immense and impossible pressures. We need to put more pressure and accountability for the rats and mice back on public sector leadership, especially the entities strengthened as part of devolution. It's already happening in Victoria, and in my view, it's working particularly well. It could go further here, and in other states, and at the Commonwealth level, it could go a whole lot further again. Ministerial responsibility should be about the big issues of policy, strategy, budgets, appointments, performance of the system, and engagement with the community. And these six areas of core ministerial responsibility, once mastered, are at the heart of effective governing. Wisdom, acquired and used by ministers in these areas, is clearly critical. So too is an effective relationship with professional public service advisors. It is these advisors who have mastered the lessons of past experience, or at least have hopefully mastered them, have become familiar with what works or doesn't, have a credible understanding of the drivers and institutions of policy in our system, and have an ability to design and manage effective and efficient implementation of what ministers decide. Getting a more realistic view of our ministerial responsibility is to see its connection to reforming our system of ministerial advisors. As I've argued elsewhere, many ministerial advisors do and have done a great job, and I actually think that the positions themselves are very important. I won't repeat my arguments here, however, but ministerial advisors are becoming a black hole of accountability within our parliamentary democracy and have a potential to distract ministers from wisdom in government. This is not a healthy sign for our parliamentary democracy, so perhaps there's something uh, in this worth debating over time. <laughs> my final area of suggested reform is what I call organisational readiness. Having seen the number of state systems and the Australian public service up close, we could do a lot more to improve the internal capacity of the public service. We chronically underinvest in professional development for public servants, while sometimes extravagantly investing in professional development for the military, for police forces, and so forth. In the Australian public service, the supposedly moribund period of the 1960s and 70s looks rosy by comparison. As we argued in the report ahead of the game, agency and departmental heads have to see themselves as the stewards of their organisation with a responsibility to developing their staff skills. In part, there is naked self-interest in that idea, because if you build the skills of your staff, then the department or agency that you lead is likely to become more productive and more innovative. But in their role as stewards, Public sector leaders also have a particular responsibility to make sure that they pass on a worthwhile institution of our democracy to their successors and to the Australian community. If I was to nominate one particular area in which the public service needs to direct more resources, it undoubtedly would be public sector management. With honourable exceptions, many of the core skills that the private sector expects in its management cohort such as project planning and management, business planning, cost benefit analysis, uh, tough minded financial planning, management analysis, the list goes on, are less apparent in the public sector. Organisations like the Institute for Public Administration can play a role in meeting that shortfall, but only if departments wake up to themselves and put more resources than they are in building these skills over the medium to long term. 
My view is the need for this commitment will only increase because under almost any conceivable future scenario, there will be a growing need for public sector staff who can handle the challenges of service delivery as it becomes more devolved to local levels, innovate continuously, and have a sufficient understanding of policy to enable them to have effective interaction with much smaller and more strategic head offices in government departments. This has all some major implications for local government. In part, that is because you are a significant employer for public administrators by already having to think and work in new ways. But it, all, it is also because the future environment that you will be working in is going to be very challenging indeed. And here I'll put on my old testament uh, profit hat for a moment. My first piece of advice, and particularly in the lead up to the election, is that everyone read the Grattan Institute's report called Budget Pressures on Australian Government. It outlines the very tough decisions that will be facing any future Australian Commonwealth Government. Its overall conclusions are pretty sobering. In essence, if we want a balanced budget that governments are prepared to make tough choices, uh, then they have, yeah, they'll have to be prepared to make tough choices than they have made, frankly, over the past decade. Smaller government is not necessarily the answer we'll have to look hard at how health services can be delivered at lower costs. And as David Gonski noted in his excellent report, we can't afford to have continued growth in education spending without searching for efficiencies as well as improvement. So my warning is that if there are people thinking that the Commonwealth will suddenly open up a major new funding stream for local government of its own accord or through things like constitutional recognition, I don't think it's going to happen in uh, the medium, even into the long-term future, because of the, uh, the sort of predictions, which are conservative predictions in the Grattan Grant Institute's report. My second piece of advice is that local government would be better off uh, following taking uh, either or both of two roads. First, if the sector puts more resources into its representation at the COEG level, uh, including its meetings, there would be a greater chance of dealing yourself into the major reform processes. And second, while I've known some very able ministers for local government in my time, my suggestion at a state level is that their usefulness is diminishing largely because they're not the ones who do the deals, the significant deals, with the Commonwealth government as part of the current process. There is no minister for state governments at the Commonwealth level. States make their case directly to the Prime Minister or to the relevant Commonwealth Minister. So if you want to signal that your sector is serious about being a player in economic growth and prosperity, then why not tell state governments to look again at how your interests are represented in that interface between the Commonwealth and the states. To conclude, none of the reform I've touched on will be easy. But the real trick will be to keep our eyes on the prize that can come from public sector reform, because it is very substantial indeed. The benefits that came from national competition policy uh, in the 90s were assessed after the event as being at about 2% of GDP per year. The COAG reform agenda, embracing human capital reforms, improving productivity and efficiency in energy, transport, and related in infrastructure sectors, and reducing regulatory burdens on business were assessed as having the potential to increase GDP over 25 years uh, to a sustainable 8% per annum increase into the future. Just a 5% improvement uh, in the productivity of health service delivery in Australia would increase GDP by almost half of 1%. Now these are very substantial increases in the size of the national economic pie. We also have to remind people that public administration and our Westminster system of parliamentary democracy isn't broken. People too often confuse a shortage of skills in governing with a shortage of good policy advice. As Laura Tinkle recently observed, the NDIS is an example of a major reform that was actually worked through a proper process. And as a result, it has not been vulnerable to the sort of problems that have affected other major initiatives such as the mineral resources rent tax. 
So there is a lot to play for if we can get the public service and public sector reform process right. I happen to think that we can, but there's a role in this for local government. Thank you.